ago that I was on a studio visit with George up at Christopher Lake, and he showed me some of his work that was going in a different direction. There were some new materials that were incorporated, um, there was some new kind of imagery, and I drove back to Prince Albert, and I thought, this is um, kind of some cool stuff that we have going on here, and it's a little bit different than, than what we know of George. And I thought it was worthy of an exhibition. And so luckily George accepted the offer to show uh, his work, and now we are here. Having said that, um, I was slightly conflicted because the work is so diverse, it is so eclectic, that I was wondering how it would come together to form a somewhat cohesive exhibition. But that's okay, because when I asked George about it, he said that his whole intention was to just experiment. That's all he wanted to do. Although, in a later conversation, he said also that um, this work was um, a redefinition of his practice that was shaped by three factors. And those factors were time, place, and media. So I'm going to use those factors to sort of guide our discussion uh, this evening. But I'm going to stop uh, yapping in a second here. Um, and before I get into some more specific questions, I just want to ask George, how does it feel to be sitting here, surrounded by some of your newer works in the gallery space? <laughs> um, <laughs> it feels good. <laughs> Great. <laughs> we have to rehearse these questions. <laughs> Answer yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's start somewhere else. <laughs> let's take um, let's take the idea of time because that has been one of the um, factors that did shape um, how your work um, has been produced in the last um, few years. But I actually want to jump back in time right now and um, tell me about um, how you first got interested in art. What spurred on that interest in art and in painting? Oh my goodness, it goes back a, a long, long way, and uh, probably the first influence uh, in my life was um, my uncle, who was a painter. And his paintings were in, in our home from, from as long as I can remember. So uh, Uncle Peter was a presence always, and he always painted a lot of still life too, so you know, when you think about it, it's a natural family genetic thing. <laughs> After that, it uh, it seemed like uh, I wasn't discouraged from going into art school, and uh, so with lots of family support, I uh, progressed from there. So you undertook your post-secondary studies at the University of Manitoba, mm -hmm. and tell me a little bit about um, what you learned at that time. Who were your teachers, and, and how did they? shape of this focus on art? Well, I was at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, and at that time there was a transition from what had been the old school of art to a university um, setting, a new building on the university setting. So we were uh, we were at the top floor, and, and sculpture and, and ceramics were on the lower floor, and in the middle was interior design. And we always used to joke about walking up and down from the top studios to the basement and smelling the expensive perfume as we parked on the floor. There, there was, uh, in, in interior design, a, a real push to have a professional presence, and we didn't know what professional presence was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the University of Winnipeg, your University of Manitoba. And was it then that um, you also realized that painting was uh, what you wanted to pursue versus Sculpture, for example. <laughs> Tell us about your adventures in sculpture. Adventures in sculpture, yeah. We had a, a professor from the, from somewhere in the United States, northern United States, and, and he wasn't happy, and, uh, and he didn't like my work. And he didn't like it so much that I think I'm the only student from the University of Manitoba who graduated. On the transcript it says, must not take another sculpture <laughs> No more sculpture for you. <laughs> right, yeah. 
<laughs> Which is kind of interesting because in these uh, later works, there's a lot of three-dimensional elements. So I wonder how that came back. It's ironic. <laughs> it is ironic. <laughs> So in 1975, you came to Prince Albert, um, not with the intention of settling here or being here on a long-term basis, but you were an artist in residence uh, with support from the Saskatchewan Arts Board. Uh, so can you share with us, what was it like here in Prince Albert at that time? And, and <laughs> I know some of you may have memories of this, but who were some of the people um, that you were working with and that, that helped shape the, the direction of your practice? Well, the first person I met in Prince Albert was Margaret Van Walsam. Karen Van Walsam is here. Yes. And uh, almost the second person I met was Audrey Martinson. Audrey Martinson is here. <laughs> So it was, there were a small group of very supportive people which made it possible for me to stay in Prince Albert. They supported me through classes and uh, they supported me because they were interested in, uh, you know, evolving sort of art practice themselves. They were looking some, for, for new challenges, new ideas. And so uh, it worked out very well. Yeah, so a really creative environment was there any form with a few people? Yeah, there were, there were wonderful people there. Um, one of the, um, I think, shaping factors, not only in an artist's life, but in anyone's life, is place or where you are uh, living. And, and that can really define our interests and, and shape who we are, I think, at any given time. Um, in many artists' work in Saskatchewan, I feel like uh, the outdoors and nature is such um, an inspiration or gives them a lot of, of information in their work and especially in this part of the province uh, and of course north of us. Uh, but I think in your work it's a little bit different. It's the opposite. Instead of going to the great outdoors, there's more of a retreat inwards. Um, you know, retreat of course to interiors, which we're seeing here tonight, and of course to a lot of still life. So, um, what, what compels you to, to depict still life? You mentioned that there's probably a genetic <laughs> trait there. Yeah, yeah. But, oh, I mean, you know, 40 some years on, you, you keep drawing from it. What is it about it? There are no flies. <laughs> <laughs> there's no wind there. You know, you know when, you're, when you're outside, you have to deal with a lot of things that don't have to do with aesthetics. They, they just have to do it with flies sticking on your painting, or mosquito. I, when I was teaching at Emma Lake, I had the lecture of being in the studio with my students. But, you know, there were so many mosquitoes at Emma Lake, it was unbelievable. And I would send them out to do their quota of, of pieces, and they'd come whining back to the studio and say there were too many mosquitoes. I would just drive them out. I would just say, get back out there and do your work. And then well, I tried it one time, I tried just standing there for one minute. It drove me crazy. It drove me crazy. So still life isn't, isn't just genetic, it's also an encouraged, encouraged gene, I think. That's how your environment shaped you, right? I like outdoors when you can see them from the studio. <laughs> I can, to a certain 
extent I can control all those elements in the painting. And there's something that, in, into a busy life, into a busy lifestyle that we all have, there, there comes a kind of order and stillness. So I'm bringing, I'm bringing that, that whole experience of a, of a frantic, almost frantic pace of life and making it still. But I also think that that on the other hand you can in your with your work instill life into something which is considered um, just objects. So so the the definition kind of goes both way in ways I like the way it plays back and forth. Um. In the last few decades, I think it's fair to say that there's been uh, an increase in the materiality of our world. We have so much stuff, so many things are available to us. Has that affected your view of both the definition and the genre? I think I've got half of all of the stuff that was ever produced in the world. It's all in the street. <laughs> Can't uh, you know? I, you know, I, my sister. My sister's in the back of the room. We talk sometimes about being uh, being the product of a depression era mentality, and my parents couldn't throw anything away, and I can't, I can't throw it away either. So, despite uh, Connie's encouragement that we should clean up, <laughs> clean up a little, I just can't think. Throw that away when we could use it again later. <laughs> that, I mean, that's a different attitude to what's happening now. I mean, it's just uh, we're inundated with plastic, so much plastic that I was, you know, I was reading today that sometimes the wrap, the plastic wrap for these plastic objects, is more valuable than the to produce than the mag, than the, the object itself. So it's just like floating islands of. It's horrible. It's truly horrible. It's choking the earth. So maybe if you can use it in your work, <laughs> then it has a, a genuine purpose. Yeah, well, that sort of leads into the next thing, well, why I can't throw paint away? <laughs> I discovered that with the acrylic paint, when I put it on a plastic palette, it will peel off. And sometimes the quality of that paint is so beautiful that I can't throw it away, but I want to reuse it. So it's constantly, I sort of feel like a hamster. I can't throw anything away. I can't reuse it. On and on it goes. It's always going to be there, it's at least in your studio. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that leads me uh, actually to my next question, which is about your studio spaces. Um, obviously, that place of creativity is so important for any artist, and it's unique for, for every artist as well. Um, and George, in George's work, it's totally central, and you can actually see that here in the gallery space because we're sitting in front of one of the largest works in this exhibition, uh, which depicts part of the interior of his studio. And just on the opposite wall, at the back of the gallery, there's uh, another portrayal of um, his part of his studio that was called Psychedelic Sunset. So a bit of a look again at the outside, a snowy day. So tell us. Um, uh, how your studios have changed over time because that certainly affected this new direction in your work. When I first came to Prince Albert, I was really lucky because the basement of the Daily Herald was available. It was um, a huge space. It was, they were 10 foot ceilings, massive cement building. And um, that space was oh, at least 3,000 square feet. And I stayed there for uh, 25 years, and I had it pretty much full. <laughs> and then, at the, at the, you know, the, the night of the millennial, when we were changing over to the new century, I had been evicted from my studio of 25 years. Conrad Black had bought the paper chain, and he wanted to see instead of um, he wanted to see black ink instead of red ink. And I was evicted, and I had to be out by by January first. So the night of the millennial, I was unpacking all the stuff that I had collected for years. It was a beautiful studio, but it looked out onto 10th Street East, 
and I could see all the feet walking by on 10th Street. Uh, so it was a basement space. And from there, I moved to the CB block, which was not a basement space. I had to walk up the stairs. It was still an apartment at that time. And I had an interior space with a skylight. And the skylight was truly beautiful. But I couldn't see anything except the, the pigeons that landed on the skylight. <laughs> then for a while, when Connie, when Connie was working at, uh, at her summer job, I used her studio in the summer. And it actually had windows and skylights. But then they sold the building, and I had to move again. And then I moved into a very nice place on the other side of, of uh, the art center. It was down in the basement. There were no windows. There was no water. And the ventilation system prevented me from using oil. But it was secure. And um, except when the lights went out, you know, it was, when, it, when the lights went out, it was completely black. So I had gone from at least basement windows to no windows at all. And then the, the, um, this building in, Prince, in uh, Christopher Lake came available. It was a garage. Some of you may remember Rose Minot. Rose Minot's partner was a contractor, general contractor, Murray Hunter, and he had died. And so there was an estate sale of the building that he used as his uh, century's workshop. So I made an offer on that, and finally I was owning the building. I actually, for the first time in my life, I owned a studio. And it, it was all on one level, and I had windows put in, so I could actually see, you know, I didn't look up at anything, I just looked straight up, and I looked straight out at trees, trees, hundreds of trees, and I thought, what do I do now? You know, like, <laughs> avoiding trees for so many years, and then suddenly something, I didn't know whether I had to paint each tree, <laughs> which trees I should eliminate. I, I got, I've got it worked out now. But it, it took me, like I moved there in 2005, and this is now 2017, so 12 years later, I'm kind of getting a handle on the trees. <laughs> um, so we've talked a little bit about uh, the use of, of material in your work and grappling with that idea of, of materiality as well. We've also discussed content, and I think in, in these works that we're seeing, both are very strong. There's highly interesting uh, use and, and mixture of different and unexpected materials. Uh, there's also content that, uh, for some, maybe is, is a familiar continuation of George's work, uh, and in other cases, it's a little bit different. So this next question is a little bit big, but tell me, what do you think is more important? It, is it the material or the content of a painting? It's always about the content. Um, sometimes you shuffle, shuffle a deck of cards around just to make things a little, a little more challenging or a little more interesting. Uh, but it, ultimately, it's always the content. So in this case, with this body of work, I was playing with materials, acrylic materials, and for, for years I told people that I didn't like acrylics and <laughs> they were evil. And, uh, and then suddenly with the turnaround of products like tar gel, which isn't, it's not like tar, it's like, it's clear, it's really clear, really shiny, and it, it en enabled me to paint and scumble my surface like I had with oil. So, uh, you know, that led, that led to a whole bunch of investigation and playing around. But ultimately, what happens is that just reinvigorates your process and, and um, breathes more life into the content of the work. There seems to be uh, certain elements that are repeated maybe repeated motifs in your paintings. So I think there's at least five depictions of a pedestal plate in this room. Uh, there's a number of flowers that uh, are the same. And uh, there's also um, even things like napkins <laughs> that have been uh, painted in and that repeat themselves 
in different works, even though it may not intentionally be a series. So, um, what is it about certain objects that that makes you want to depict them repeatedly? I don't know. Yes. <laughs> I know that uh, when I see a when I see a plate or a table rather, when I see a, a, an empty table, a little white table, whoa, something really. Something happens, white table, white tables, tables. You know, there's tables everywhere. And I think it'd be, it's my playground for shuffling things around to create a composition which will elicit the sort of feel that I want from a painting. And it seems that that little stage, that little kind of stage, you, you've noted that too, that these little tables become like little brightly lit settings. So I don't know why that, oh, I don't know what made me that way, but I, I, oh, I just love going into houses that are nearly empty, you know, because you can imagine how, how you would arrange that space and what you would do with it. Same with a, an empty table. You know, I just can't help shuffling little objects around to create the environment that I want from on that table. Do you consider that to be like a, a mini stage, or just, or not? It's just there. Yeah, I think I think it's a mini stage. I think it's like it's like theater. It's like a theater stage, and the objects in the painting are like actors, and they play a part. And sometimes what they do is they simply set up the negative space. The space between the actors becomes the important part of the content of the painting. Um, I think in a number of the images that are here, you can see where um, something has been viewed by you in real life. Um, the inspiration comes from a tangible object and then you kind of let the materials become that object in the work and the materials take over a little bit. Not to say that they become more important than, <laughs> than the depiction yeah. of the thing yeah. itself. Uh, other pieces are more abstract. There's nothing that can be identified as as coming from your studio or your life and it, or a tangible area. Um, can you tell us about the, the difference in those? Is there a difference? You know, when Paige was talking about um, the idea of portals and, and stories and imagining, I think that everybody looks to uh, art for a kind of narrative. And uh, I'm no different. When I'm painting, I, I make up my own stories. You may, you may not see them. Uh, you may make your own narrative as part of you, uh, what you do as a spectator. But for me, the, the, the narrative is a really important part of the painting process. So even on, on pieces that are abstract, for example, the whole suite of paintings at the back, the small paintings, are so small that um, I could kind of hold them on my lap and hold them at my table, and, and so it was very intimate what I was what I was doing there. And so a block of wood, and a beautiful rectangle of turquoise, they start to speak to me in a kind of way, and, and I interact. And at the end of the process, the narrative obviously has been important to me. I couldn't tell you what the narrative was necessarily. I mean, sometimes it's a flying rock, or sometimes it's an angel, or you know, or just a block of wood. But I have to be engaged, and I think the narrative process is really important. In that. Um, when we were setting up this exhibition, and, and George had come in, we're seeing how things were going, reviewing the layout, etc. Um, George noted that one of the surprises of seeing all of the work together in this space is that there was actually uh, a lot of darkness in many of the pieces. Not necessarily a dark message, but literally just a dark uh, color. And I guess that makes sense because in the studio space, um, you would see much more clearly and directly some of these larger pieces that are quite big and bright. Um, versus some of the smaller dark ones. So uh, what does that, um, I guess, play in the difference in color mean to you? And, and then on a larger question, uh, how does color factor into your work? 
Color's always been really important um, to my work. Um, why? I mean, for, for years I, I denied the presence of yellow in my work. I <laughs> said I couldn't paint with yellow and then students would come to the studio and they'd see all these yellow paintings. <laughs> I couldn't account for why they were there. And I, I never paint, I've never painted but red like that or red like that. But you know, that red was so, that red surface was so stunning. <laughs> you, it was so stunning that I couldn't paint on it for a long time until I knew where I wanted. The surface was just beautiful. The, the quality of the red and the tar gel over the red made it so shiny and clear and dynamic. Um, then, then the painting right at the back, the psych psychedelic sunset, I mean that was an overlay of, of colors allowing some of the undercolors to come through and enliven in, in the top layers of paint. It's another kind of way of working with color, but, you know, I don't know what, what it is. When you get old, maybe you work with bright colors. <laughs> 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 can hardly wait for cataracts. <laughs> Before we wrap up, one, I'm wondering if you can share with us your favorite piece in this exhibition oh, and why. Absolutely, oh, absolutely. The, my favorite piece is right behind Alec. It's uh, the, one of the small pieces. No, no, no that's the one, that's the one. It's a, a little tiny piece. I'd uh, been experimenting with some. I have this powder, a copper powder, I've never used it. I made a texture at, with the tar gel. And then I threw the powder down on it, and it created this beautiful bronzy quality. But then I also had this transparent layer that I lifted off my palette. And it had these beautiful jagged edges, and I put it down on this little piece, and it just was perfect. It was so perfect. I didn't plan it. I didn't do it. It just, it was like given to me. It was so, it's so amazing. It's so fast. And I love that. I love that piece. Can you hear me say that? <laughs> anyway, that's my that's my favorite piece. I love the edge. I love the translucence. I like the undercolor of the underpainting coming through. Perfect. Fantastic. Make sure you get a good look at that one. It is a little little gem there. That's why it have its own wall as well. <laughs> I also want to ask. Um, uh, in regards to all of your work, what is it that you want viewers to to take away when they view your work? I had such a lot of fun doing these paintings. I mean, maybe I shouldn't have fun. Maybe I shouldn't say that. But I, like, it was just it was just fun. It was fun to play with the paint and to experiment. It was free, very very free. I felt that I threw away a lot of rules that I I don't know why I've been subscribing to this set of rules anyway, but there didn't seem to be any need to follow the rules anymore. And uh, um, I'd like, I'd like, no, I give the paintings to the public, and I'd like people to look at these paintings, and I'd like them to recreate them, or recreate them in their own minds. I mean, once, they, once I finish with them, they're just an object. But once the viewer sees them, engages with them, they become alive again. So, so I'd like you to go to that place, or go to the painting. It doesn't have to be what I think or see or intended for that painting to be. But I want you to, to be engaged with the paintings and find some of that same freedom that I found when I was making them. I think there's certainly a lot of opportunity for that with the works of these shows. There's so much to delve into with, with every single piece. Um, so thanks, George. Thanks for uh, having a chat tonight. <laughs> uh, on that note, George said that he's broken a lot of rules. Maybe he doesn't care about them so much now. But there actually is an opportunity for him to perhaps teach you some of these rules. I wanted to mention that um, 
When George retired in 2013, he had retired um, from teaching, uh, teaching painting and drawing, specifically through the University of Saskatchewan's Extension Division. Uh, George has also uh, been a wonderful teacher in summer workshops that take place every July at the Arts Centre, which is just a few blocks east of us. And um, luckily, uh, George still does teach those summer workshops. So if you are interested, uh, no matter what level you are, total beginner or accomplished artist, do consider gleaning some of George's wonderful um, experience and knowledge through those workshops at the Arts Centre. Um, contact them for more information or a staff at the Man Art Gallery can also point you in the right direction as well. Um, I just want to share one more item with you before we wrap up and uh, I'll let you chat uh, with George and of course have some more food and drink and, and see the works. Um, many of you know that uh, Diane and Roger Mann are just fantastic patrons of the arts here in Prince Albert and the Mann Art Gallery is so um, grateful to benefit from their generosity. And one way um, that they support the gallery and support artists is by earmarking part of their annual donation um, specifically for the acquisition of artworks into our permanent uh, collection. And this is really important for a few reasons. Not only does it support artists, but it allows us to build up this fantastic uh, visual example of both historical and contemporary works that, that really describe who we are uh, at a given time uh, in Prince Albert. And so part of my job is to select some works um, every year to be part of that permanent collection. And I'm really pleased to share with you all that there will be at least one work from this show coming into the collection. Um, and in fact, I'm purchasing it tonight. And that piece is the self-portrait at the very front of this show. George and thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of your evening.